morning sun coast
hopelessness You found this mess You saw me here within it The same road I walk Is a road you walk To welcome me home again Maybe the space that I made Was to measure your grace Still you stretch us out beyond To every faded heart And the worlds they part As your tears fall, my fears pale, your love still stands. And every doubt weighed against love's embrace has broken, lean into hope. And as your love lives to carry on, this light will shine.
Morning, Sun Coast. Good to see you. I'm Dr. Troy Doucet, one of the teaching pastors here at Sun Coast. And it is a big week here at Sun Coast. So I'm going to begin by giving you some announcements that are happening in the life of the church that you can plug into and kind of get connected. First, this Wednesday night in this room, 7 p.m., encore. This isn't this band like so boss, dude. This band is. They make, look, they make it easy to preach. Like, I've been preaching for years, and I've preached after some sucky bands. I gotta make up for it with my good looks alone, you know? But these guys, man, are absolutely incredible. They are gonna be on stage. It is a worship night experience, 7 p.m. But blue cheese, or big blue gourmet filled cheese, food truck will be here at five o'clock. So you can come early, get your grub on, then get your worship on. We'll be here, hang out, plug in, connect with this awesome band. They are incredible. This Friday from four to eight, again, in this room, they move all of these chairs out and it is bounce blast, a fun-filled night from four to eight this Friday for your whole family. Bring your neighbors, bring your friends. They've put inflatables all over this auditorium, inside the AC, outside the heat. And you know what, even as an adult, Brett, I look at inflatables and I go, oh, I'm thinking hard about going bounce. But my joints will not like that, right? That's sort of how, how it happens when you're 50 years old. Bounce Blast Friday. Also, I love this part about being a pastor. And this next Sunday at 6 p.m. on Siesta Key Beach, we'll remind you again next week, is our beach baptism at, at the Magic Yellow Lifeguard Stand on Siesta Pastor Brett, Pastor Larry, myself will be there to dunk you under. And we have a little caveat. We, we hold you under for as long as the sins need to be atoned for, right? So we ask you on the card, how long can you hold your breath? Because we may need a double dunk you, you know, kind of like a double dunk Oreo. But that's all the announcements, man. Be beach baptism, bounce blast, and out encore coming up. It's going to be an awesome week here at Suncoast. But today, we are in week seven of a series we've called Practical Prescriptions. And these are like not real heavy theological or philosophical ideas, but really practical ideas that we can put in our life if we really want more out of life. To think about things a little bit differently and who we are as people who are trying to really follow God in our life. All of those sermons are online. The first six weeks are up there, but I wanna remind you, last week, Dr. Bachman and I shared the stage, and we talked about how do we hate well? You know, hate has a term, is a term that we really don't like to use. We don't like to teach our kids to use it. But if we understand hate as a type of gift that God has given us, to hate the right things in the right way, hating policies and principles as opposed to people, if we can differentiate that, man, that can make, make up for something in our life to give us like action to take. This week, we're on week number seven, and I'm excited but yet nervous. This is what we're gonna call don't play fair. Don't play fair. And this is one of those sermons where as I prepared all week, as I studied, as I prayed, as I wrote and thought, it, was, it became fairly obvious to me that I'm gonna be preaching this sermon to myself. Martin Luther once said, we absolutely teach best what we need to learn most. And so I ask for grace today, Suncoast, that I have not perfected this area of not playing fair in my own life and relationships. It is a difficult principle. It is one that is gonna turn this idea of fairness on its head for you. So when I say the word fair, like something is fair or fairness, 
what comes to your mind? Typically, most people respond like fairness or being fair is like this moral principle that's innate inside of us, right? Like impartiality, not showing favoritism. And we govern our lives with these rules of human fairness, right? Like anybody watch football? Like I love football or basketball, whatever. There are rules that govern how you participate in that competitive game. But yet, not only do we have rules, you have people who enforce those rules. They're called what? Referees, and they're dressed not like everyone else on the court. So in football, if a player does something that's not fair, what does the referee do? Blows a whistle, throws a flag, right? How many guys have ever been busted speeding? Cop cars don't look like regular cars, right? Cops don't dress like regular people. They turn on those big lights, pull you over give you a ticket, right? To enforce the rules of fairness on the road. How many guys ever were doing the speed limit? You see a cop in the median, how many guys still tap your brake? That's because we're awful people, right? No, I'm just picking. These ideas of fairness are really just supposed to create within our mindset these notions of equality, impartiality. Again, not showing favoritism. But I remember one time when I was real young, this notion of what I thought was fair got flipped on its head. I was a boxer for about four years. I boxed from like age 11 to like 14. I had 32 fights, I lost one fight. And I remember I was going to Biloxi, Mississippi because I'd qualified for this regional tournament. And here I am, I was like 12 years old at the time. And you'd go there and the referees would wrap your hands with gauze, right? To create like sturdiness because I mean, you're about to punch a guy in the face, you need some sturdiness. But sitting next to me was a kid, a little bit older than me, a little heavier than me. He was getting his hand wrapped, and he had a nub. His arm was cut right below the elbow. So they were wrapping that with gauze, they put the glove on it, and tied it real tight with tape. And I was like, this is, this is not gonna be a fair fight. You know, everyone else I've seen has two good hands. And Nubby here is, is at a quite disadvantage, you know? I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I just forgot his name. It was like Ronnie or whatever. And I remember going to my teammates like, we have to watch this fight. Like, this is going to be crazy. I've never seen a boxer with that. So he gets in the ring and he's talking to his coach. And his opponent, who obviously has two good hands, two good gloves, turns around and sees his opponent, his opponent who's at a disadvantage, and this like air of arrogance just floods over him. You, you know what I'm talking about. He's like, <sighs> like he, he's thinking to himself, this isn't fair, until that bell rang. This guy came out, and it just took one hit from that nub. Boom! And this guy with two good hands realized, oh, he's pretty good. And it may be a minute and a half to this fight, me and my friends are on the front row going, we cannot believe this is happening, because this guy's going, dip, brrr, dip. Like, I don't know what was in this, but it was faster than this. And I saw something Stefan, something I never saw in my life in any boxing match. The kid with two good hands let out this shrieking scream as he was getting pummeled by the thing. And he jumped out of the ring and ran to the locker room. The entire crowd was like, what did we just witness? We thought it was unfair, and it absolutely was an unfair fight but in a way we never really ever thought. I remember the great psychologist, Dr. Henry Cloud, was doing this marriage conference, and I tuned in online to see, because he is very, he's very uh, controversial in his ways of approaching things. And he asked the crowd in this marriage conference of people who were mostly married or thinking about getting married, he said, what do you think would be the formula that would completely destroy not only your marriage, but any relationship you find yourself in. And of course the crowd responded with typical things that we would think about like lying, cheating, lack of intimacy, being overly critical of your significant other. But his feedback took me back. 
And he said, here's what you can do to ruin every relationship you have, not just your marriage. Play fair. Playing fair will eventually ruin each and every one of your relationships. Some may go quicker than others and others may last longer, but in the end, if you succeed at playing fair, the consequence is that all of your relationships will be ruined. I mean, what? Fairness is supposed to be a good thing, right? We love people who play by the rules and we get mad at those who try to break the rules, right? I mean, if Brett and I are playing chess and he starts making checker moves with the king, my boxing skills are coming up. Especially if there's money on the line, bro. Sorry, man. But the truth is this, Dr. Cloud was wanting to get the audience to appreciate something deeper and more meaningful, as opposed to fairness just being the sense of impartiality or morality. He was challenging us to see a bigger picture, that to succeed in life and love and relationships, you need to be more than just fair. You need to be more than just a person who will be given to because it was given to you, right? You need to be more than I will do for you because you've done for me. There's a principle here at play that fairness is just tit for tat. You do good for me, I will do good for you. You yell at me, I will yell at you. But here's what I wanna say, and this is the principle of Jesus. If I fail you in some way, I need you to help me get back up and not simply get back at me. You guys following? I lost most of you right there. If I do something wrong to you, I need the opportunity for redemption, not just your retaliation. If we solely play by the moral rule of being fair, we remove the chance for grace. And if we, if we remove grace from the equation, we lose the opportunity for transformation. Think about that. Father Richard Rohr says this, the Christian life and following Jesus is mostly learned when we do it wrong, not when we get it right. That is an absolute fact. And look at what Jesus says in Matthew 5. This is a great scripture. We've all read it before. You've heard it said, you've been taught that this is true. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evil person. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, Slap them back. What does he say? Give them the other one also. If anyone wants to sue you for your shirt, give them your coat too. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to the one who asks you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I tell you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on evil and the good. Does that sound fair? No. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Does that sound fair? No. If you love only those who love you, what reward do you get? Even tax collectors do that. And if you greet only your own people, what are you doing more than others? Even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. I'll come back to that word perfect in just a moment. A couple of truths today if you're taking notes. Point number one is this. Playing fair in any relationship is a formula for disaster. This idea Jesus is teaching about, you've heard it said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. This was called the lex talionis. It literally translates the law of retaliation. And it comes from the Hammurabi law about 1750 B.C., and this law was instilled to create a moral sense of fairness between humans. Because we humans, you know, we have a bunch of problems. And if two boys were out like shooting rocks or whatever with a slingshot, and one boy shot another boy in the eye and he lost his eye, usually the retaliation was not equal to what was lost. Usually that young boy would be killed by the other boy's family. And we know this, right? If you're yelling with your spouse, what do you do? Do you take it down a notch or do you crank up? Right? Yeah, I feel that conviction too. I'm guilty of that. Usually our retaliation, if we had it our way, would be in excess of what hurt us. 
But the Lex Talionis came around to try to create this understanding of equality, equity, morality, fairness. But why? Why is Jesus saying that's not the way? You've heard it said this, but now I say to you, well, I mean, it's pretty simple. No human that I know wants to be taken advantage of. Have you ever been taken advantage of in a relationship? Have you ever been taken advantage of by a job? Ever felt like you were cheated? Yeah, it's unfair. Makes you feel horrible, like you're weak, insignificant. And Jesus understood this more than anyone. What happened to his life? You think he was treated fairly? Of course not. He wants to bring us to this new level of understanding. He wants to teach us that our morality of fairness is just another external mechanism for control. Jesus is driving home this, this idea that our life is not to be driven by fairness and justice, but by love and forgiveness. So what do we do when we get less than we, we deserve or give in a relationship? What do we do when I'm giving my boss hours and hours of work and I see little return on my paycheck? This human sense of being fair is good though, right? We want what we've given. If you make me late, I'm gonna make you late next time. Equal. If you yell at me, I'm gonna respond by yelling at you. Now we're equal. But here's the truth, here's the sad reality about this philosophy. Good people, fair people, divorce every day. Good and fair businesses close their doors every day. Good families that are fair and impartial split up every day. Because here's the thing, fair doesn't always work. The problem occurs when we try to use this sense of moral fairness in a vacuum. We need to learn that we need to give understanding and not just fairness. We need to earn, understand that we need to give acceptance even to those who've rejected us. I have this saying I live by over and over again. I want to love people when they least expect it and even more so when they least deserve it. Life isn't fair, and we all know that. We've all said that at some point in our life. This isn't fair. Jesus knew this. His disciples knew this. Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, knew this. And we know this truth to be, to be true as well. Life isn't fair, but that's not the goal of life. Fairness, justice, equality is not the goal of life. What is it? Being Christ-like, and that's what's hard. It's hard to follow Jesus, man. But listen to what the great British theologian G.K. Chesterton said. He said, Christianity has not been tried and found wanting. It has been found difficult and left mostly untried. But that leads me to point two. We're only gonna harvest the type of seeds we plant in our lives and in the lives of others. So what are you planting right now? Are you planting seeds of like fairness, equality, justice? Good, those are great things. But God is calling us to plant more than just that. I wanna say this as emphatically as I can. Whatever is happening in your life right now, whether you think it's good or bad, it's based upon seeds you've planted in the past. Listen to what Galatians says, don't be deceived. God isn't mocked for whatever a person sows, they're going to reap. What does that mean? I can't plant apple seeds and expect avocado trees to grow. My ex-brother-in-law, his name's John, he has a master's degree in horticulture. We used to go camping all the time. And this dude knew every plant, every leaf, every tree in the freaking forest. Uh, this is a sumus notius, whatever. I was like, great, it's pretty. That's a pretty, I don't like that tree, that tree's ugly. Like I had this subjective understanding of trees and plants, they're either pretty or not pretty, not attractive. That's just subjective based upon my preference. But you know how I knew a tree? How old Troy with no master's degree in horticulture knew? If I saw an apple growing on a tree, I went, oh, apple tree. Big brain. And it's funny because Jesus says this in Matthew 7, you're gonna know those who are truly trying to follow me by their fairness. No, that's not what he said. You're gonna know who follow me by their Jesus tattoos. 
No. You got to know them because they quote Bible verses on Instagram. That's how you know my followers. No, Jesus says, you're going to know my followers by their fruit. So think about the trees again. Whether I think they're pretty or ugly has no bearing. When an apple's on a tree, that's an apple tree. And the idea here is that many people in the Christian faith have equated following Jesus to simply believing in Jesus. That's not how it works. Why? Because I can believe all the right things and never do them. I can believe that being healthy is a lifestyle worth fighting for, but never step foot in a gym. I can believe that loving my wife is the most important part of my relationship with her and never tell her I love her. See, I can believe all the right things and never do them because there's a difference. What dictates our actions and behavior is not your belief. It's what you value. Therefore, any action I see, the fruit, is what your value is. All of human action and behavior in the world is the fruit of what you value most. It's not until I actually value some idea or belief that my behaviors will match that evaluation. Whatever you're reaping in your life right now, whether you think it's good or bad, is a result of what you have valued in the past and planted in your life. But to experience and reap Christ-likeness in my life, I need to begin to sow something that's far better than just simple fairness. Does that make sense? Point number three, if you're taking notes. Jesus expands our view of fair beyond human morality and into Christ-like maturity. Listen to what Luke's account of Jesus' teaching says. It's very similar to the Matthew verse I just read. And here Jesus is like so savage. Like, he, like I want to do a series if Dr. Bauckham lets me. I don't want to call it Jesus Savior. I want to call it Jesus Savage. Because he is savage in what he is saying. He is ripping the moral fiber of what we think is right or wrong and saying, no, we have to be more than just moral. We gotta be more than just equal. We gotta be more than just fair. There is something beyond this life of existence that creates meaning and purpose. Listen to what he says in Luke. Listen to me. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, give him the other. If someone takes your cloak, don't stop him from taking your, clo- your tunic as well. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Do to others, not as they've done to you, but as you would have them do to you. Jesus is asking his followers to break the cycle of simple fairness, tit for tat, eye for an eye way of looking at the world. I want you to ask yourself this. How can I do that? Someone's wronged me. Someone's hurt me. How how can I give love and forgiveness when I feel slighted, when I feel this pain, when I feel used and abused? I want you to ask yourself, if you were in their shoes, would you want mercy? Would you want grace? Would you want forgiveness? How can you do that? Troy, you don't understand. This person hurt me. If I forgive them, I'm gonna be seen as weak. I'm gonna be seen as insignificant, like people are gonna walk all over me. Last I checked, God still has you in his hand. God is still the judge of all. But I don't want to be seen. I need to be seen as strong. We humans, you're strong, Troy. Look at you. You you, you know. No. Let me ask you this. What takes more strength? Forgiving someone, showing them mercy and grace, or retaliating, getting revenge? 2 Corinthians 12 says, in my moments of weakness, that word weakness simply means when I don't have the strength to do something I know I need to do that God is strongest in my life. When I am weak, he is strong. And I know that it goes against everything even my mom and dad taught me. Nothing wrong with being strong, nothing wrong with being fair, but we have to be more than that. Like that song we just sang, 
Like I had my, I was sitting over here, my hands were raised. I'm not enough unless you come. Meet me here again. Why? Because all I know is to play fair, to give back the hurt that was given me. I don't want to forgive. I don't want to love them. That's right. But when I do, that is the fruit Jesus is talking about. And that proves that I can't do it. Only him through me can that happen. How many times do I need to forgive and forget, Troy? Well, Jesus says 70 times seven per offense, per person, per day, if necessary. And that's the point. It ain't fair. It ain't fun. But that's what it means to be faithful, to become Christ-like. Let me give you something that's helped me to begin to not play fair. The only way that I, as an imperfect person who's selfish, who only worries about their own well-being sometimes, who doesn't want to be taken advantage of like many of you in here, the only way that I could ever extend this type of grace is when I, is when I look at the person who's harmed me, hurt me, disrespected me, and I see my face in theirs. And I go, I would need that same grace and mercy. It's the only way. If I see myself in them, would I want that grace? Would I want that mercy? It's not about deserving. It's about what I want, and therefore I should do unto others as I would want them to do for me. And how did that verse end? I said I'd come back to it. Jesus says, therefore, be perfect, just like your heavenly Father is perfect. That word perfect has no moral understanding in that scripture. It's not about being perfect without blemish. The word perfect there is this word teleos. It literally means, this is what's awesome, do what you were created to do. Become who God created you to be. And you know what? For some of you, maybe a doctor, lawyer, whatever, it's not about your occupation. There's one purpose God has given all humanity, and that's like, be like me. Be like Christ. That's your end goal. You want to be perfect in life? It has nothing to do with the perfect circle of being morally complete. It has everything to do with I am striving to be just like Jesus. No eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, equality, fairness. I need to be more than that. You were not built for fairness. You were built for faithfulness. Let me pray for you, Suncoast. Father, I pray for my friends, my family, my community, that we would just think about this hard teaching today, to not play fair, to be more than moral but to be Christ-like. God, give us the strength to do that even in our weakest moments. It's in your strong name we pray, amen. Stand with me, Suncoast. I wanna give you our prescription today and then tell you a quick story. Here's the prescription. Don't play fair. Run up the score in loving and forgiving others when they least expect it and even more when they least deserve it. What does that mean, run up the score? October 2007, I remember the New England Patriots were playing the Washington Redskins. And this was at the height of their dynasty, right? They, were, they won the game 52 to seven. But in the fourth quarter, with New England leading 38 to zero, Bill Belichick says, we're going for it on fourth down. The crowd got all in a tizzy. The game's over, there's two minutes left. They scored. Again, later in that quarter, the fourth quarter, it's 45 to nothing. They went for it again on fourth down, and all these ESPN announcers were like, they're running up the score. And I thought, what if we ran up the score, but in doing more than morality? What if we ran up the score on love and grace and forgiveness to people who didn't expect it or didn't deserve it? What would that look like? I remember when I was single, this is five and a half years ago, I just picked up my children from school because it's weekend at daddy's, right? Dude, I look forward to those weekends every time. This was early on. I was no longer living in the home, but I was paying the mortgage and all the bills where my ex-wife was staying because my children were there. But I was also paying rent on a little 400 square foot apartment in Dallas. It's a lot to take on. It wasn't about being fair. It was about being faithful to what I committed to until the end. I remember I picked up my children and I said, yo, we gotta go grocery shopping. 
you guys like to eat. How unfortunate, you know. I remember going to Albertsons right next to my little apartment. And we're pushing the basket. They're getting snacks. We're getting necessities like, you know, Captain Crunch and things like that. And I remember going through the checkout and the girl checks it out and came up to like 88, 89 bucks. And I pull out my card, my debit card, and I swipe it. Decline. Can we try again? Do you have another card, sir? No. What do I do? Man standing behind me started twisting his little Mercedes Benz keys, looking at me like, what an irresponsible father. What a loser. He got these three little kids and can't even buy, can't even buy groceries. Looking at me like something's wrong with me. Like I was an imbecile, but yet I just worked like 18 hours. And I remember going, well, kids, Here's what we got to do. They go, what are we going to do, Daddy? What are we going to do? I said, let's leave these groceries, these nice people to put them back up, get in Daddy's car. And I put my phone on my magnet, and I turned on my Uber Eats delivery driver app. And for the next five hours, my children came with me, deliver food for Uber. And I made like 85 bucks in like five hours. And they helped me. They delivered it to the door. Deposited in my check, I said, let's go back to Albertsons. How embarrassed do you think I was? How fair is that? I worked all week, but I got all these bills to pay. I was hurt. I was embarrassed. But I remember three weeks ago, I walk into Publix. Friends are coming over to the house. I'm about to cook. This little single mom's in front of me with two kids. She gets all these groceries. She swipes her card. It was like a little over 200 bucks for her groceries. Declined. The woman standing behind her is like, I remember that feeling. And she's like, oh. And the lady's like, do you have another card, ma'am? She's like, no, I don't know. I walked over and I went, boop. Have a good day. I, I don't, I appreciate the, the clap, but I was able to do that because I saw my face in hers. My face, it's not about equality, morality, being fair. What's fair is, hey, you need to go get your money together. You gotta find a way to pay. You got these two kids, like that's what fairness is. But God calls us to be more than fair. I don't have just $200 sitting in my account, man. I got kids to fly to Florida, I got stuff I need to do. And I went, no, God's got me. And it doesn't mean like I'm gonna do this for you with God to pay me back in some way. I did it because I saw my, my face in that woman's face. That's what God calls us to do, guys. Become who God created you to be. And that's more and more and more like him. I hope and pray that we can do that, Suncoast. Have a great Sunday. Take care. Mm -hmm.